Having defeated Shao Kahn, Liu Kang believed he was the only one capable of defending Earthrealm against outside threats. During the invasion, Raiden had been more burden than ally. Brazenly, he demanded the Elder Gods grant him the Thunder God status. In a one-match Mortal Kombat tournament, Liu Kang defeated his former friend and mentor. Liu Kang's request was granted. He was made a god, the new protector of Earthrealm. Shao Kahn's death did nothing to relieve Scorpion's pain. The loss of his kin still weighed heavily upon him. For reasons he could neither explain nor understand, he was drawn to the home of the Shirai Ryu. Standing amid the rubble in solemn contemplation, Scorpion was visited by apparitions of his fallen comrades, who revealed the true mastermind behind their brutal deaths. Enraged, he returned to the Nether Realm. As the spirits of his kin immobilized Quan Chi, Scorpion slew him, finally avenging their deaths. Kung Lao had avenged his ancestor's death and saved Earthrealm from Shao Kahn's brutality. In quiet reflection with Raiden at the grave of the great Kung Lao, he touched the modest stone marker. Images of past events, moments of someone else's life, flashed through his mind, concluding with a lost battle against Goro. Raiden theorized that Kung Lao had unlocked memories of his past life. The Kung Lao that stood before Raiden was in fact the reincarnation of the great Kung Lao, who had been defeated by Goro 500 years ago. He had accomplished in the present what he could not in the past. After the victory over Shao Kahn, Sub-Zero learned from Raiden the truth, that the Lin Kuei were ultimately responsible for the deaths of both Sub-Zero's and Scorpion's families. Enraged, Sub-Zero offered Scorpion a chance to share in his quest for vengeance. With the might of fire and ice combined, they were a storm of vengeful fury as they cut down their foes. Once justice had been done, Sub-Zero and Scorpion disappeared into legend, emerging from obscurity only to avenge the innocent. The forces of darkness will never stop this deadly alliance. Kitana had ended Shao Kahn's life for his betrayal. She had discovered the truth about Melina, but rather than slay her as well, she took pity on her half-sister. She offered Melina a home within the Edenian aristocracy. She was, after all, of royal blood. Melina cautiously accepted her sister's invitation. With Melina and Jade at her side, Kitana formed a fighting force dedicated to bringing justice to the realms. Never again would a warlord arise to create such terror. Having defeated Shao Kahn, Reptile was feared by all. He forced Shang Tsung to regenerate his raptor race. The process took agonizing months, but soon Reptile heard the snarls of young broodlings throughout the flesh pits. Eventually, Shang Tsung had created an army of raptor warriors bred to serve Reptile. They stormed the realm, killing any Tarkatan, Shokan, or Centaur who opposed Reptile's rule. The intoxicating feeling of reuniting with his people blinded Reptile to the suffering of his former comrades. Reptile was home once more. With Shao Kahn dead, Ermac was no longer bound to him. 
Anarchy erupted within Ermac as the many warrior souls that comprised his being struggled for dominance. Only one had the strength of will to quiet the chaos. The conflict resolved, Ermac returned to Outworld, determined to reunite with his past. Queen Sindel and Princess Katana were shocked to learn the truth. The trapped among the many spirits within Ermac was their husband and father, King Jared. Though he would never be the Jared they once knew, Ermac would forever serve and protect his queen and the Adenian people. The spell that bewitched Queen Sindel had been broken. She did battle with Shao Kahn and slew him, punishment for the suffering he brought upon her and millions of others throughout the realms. She dissolved the sorcery that bound Edenia with Outworld and began restoring her realm to its former glory. The many races of Outworld were impressed. Not only had Sindel defeated Shao Kahn, but she had shown great leadership in chaotic times. They willingly offered her their allegiance. Under Sindel's governance, the realms of Edenia and Outworld remain merged in spirit. As the last remnants of Shao Kahn disintegrated, Johnny felt strange as if he had lost control of his body. Suddenly, powerful energy burst forth, destroying everything around him. Johnny sought the aid of Raiden and Nightwolf, but their efforts did nothing to stop these random spasms of destruction. Desperate, Raiden transported Johnny to Sado, the realm of order, where he could be taught to control his power. Johnny Cage will transform into a warrior powerful beyond mortal imagining. It took all of Nightwolf's power to destroy Shao Kahn. His spirit guide, the Wolf, had aided him in the battle. But in the aftermath, its presence was no longer felt. Nightwolf returned to his home, seeking the Elder's help in reconnecting to the spirit world. During their ritual, his wolf returned to him, changed. Shao Kahn had tethered his soul to the wolf spirit in order to cheat death. Now corrupted with Shao Kahn's evil, Nightwolf has transformed into his animality, his bite converting his victims into subservient lycanthropes. Through Nightwolf, Shao Kahn will conquer Earthrealm one mortal at a time. Melina killed the Emperor in a fit of deranged fury, but she was unaware that her victory resulted from Shang Tsung's designs. He had imbued Melina with the ability to drain Shao Kahn's dark magic, rendering him vulnerable. Now Shang Tsung was ready to execute the next phase of his plan, murder Melina and take Shao Kahn's power for himself. But Melina instinctively wielded her new dark power against the sorcerer. Shang Tsung's end came quickly. Melina absorbed his soul, multiplying her strength. She then set out to claim an even bigger prize. The soul of a thunder god. Shao Kahn was defeated, but the intense battle rendered Jade unconscious. She slipped into a dreamlike state and found herself walking in an unknown realm. As she explored, her surroundings shifted and changed. Jade approached a lone figure who stood in the distance, a shimmering woman. She did not reveal her name, but spoke with an air of regal authority. Through the minds of countless mortals, the woman had been watching events as they unfolded over the centuries. She informed Jade that Shao Kahn's death was an outcome that must be reimagined. Jade was defenseless, 
as the woman possessed her body and emerged in the waking world. Sector had dedicated his life to the Lin Kuei. His victories had brought honor to his father, the Grand Master. He had proven himself worthy. It was time to replace his father. In a bold attack, Sector smashed through a company of Lin Kuei guards as he pushed toward the Grand Master's chamber. There he found his father waiting. The Grand Master warned him that wearing the Dragon Medallion brought much power, but at a cost. Sector ignored the warning and slew his father, whose soul burst from his body and flew into the medallion. Sector had finally seized control of the Lin Kuei. Shao Kahn's violent death shook the very core of Smoke's being and dislodged his earliest memories. Tomas Rabada was only a boy when he was abducted by an obscure cult and sacrificed to a demon. Burned alive, he returned to the mortal realm as an Anenra, a creature of smoke and vapor. His captors were helpless against his shapeless form as he lashed out with rage, killing them all. His murder avenged, he returned to his human form, remembering nothing of his former life. Now aware of his true identity, Smoke understands he is no mere assassin. His destiny has been revealed. Quan Chi should never have resurrected Noob Saibot, nor should he have enhanced his power to defeat Shao Kahn. The revenant he created had broken free of his control. Noob had secretly formed an understanding with a cleric from the realm of chaos and opened for him a portal to the nether realm. Shinnok, Quan Chi, and the Brotherhood of Shadow were unprepared as the forces of chaos overwhelmed them, leaving the underworld severely weakened. Satisfied with his work, the cleric, Havoc, returned to the realm of chaos. Noob Saibot remained to seize control of the Netherrealm. Though he had pledged his life to the Lin Kuei, Cyrax left the clan to help the Earthrealm heroes turn back Shao Kahn's invasion. For this act of desertion, he was marked for termination by the new Grand Master, Sector. Surrounded and severely outnumbered, Cyrax prepared to meet his fate when Raiden came to his aid. With him were 100 Shaolin monks. The Lin Kuei were defeated, though Sector was not counted among the dead. Cyrax was offered sanctuary at the Wuxi Academy, where he has begun a new life as an honorable warrior for peace. Despite telling the world that he was simply doing his job, Stryker was made a hero for saving Earth from invasion. He received both the key to the city and the Congressional Medal of Freedom. Press and paparazzi hounded his every move. His biography spent a year on the bestseller lists. Striker action figures flew off the shelves and into every young boy's hand. But when approached by Hollywood for the rights to his story, Striker put his foot down. Never would he allow himself to be portrayed by Johnny Cage. Kano made a fortune selling arms to Shao Kahn and used the profits to upgrade his cybernetics. The added connectivity of his eye implant gave him unparalleled access to global communications. Using his mind, he navigated the databases of banks, law enforcement agencies, and other networks. But his activities left him vulnerable to hackers. Jax infiltrated Kano's mind and trapped his consciousness in the Special Forces mainframe. 
It wasn't long, however, until Kano managed to free himself. His consciousness spread like a virus throughout the Special Forces network of automated weaponry. Kano has become a one-man army. After the invasion was thwarted, many of Jax's allies had seemingly disappeared, leaving him to clean up the mess on his own. He searched for Shao Kahn's remaining forces, utilizing a new cyber scanner designed to remotely access worldwide databases. Navigating its virtual reality interface, Jax inadvertently accessed Kano's brain through his optical laser implant. Their minds linked, Jax virtually battled Kano. Finally, he captured and quarantined Kano's consciousness within the Special Forces mainframe. The dangerous criminal had finally been neutralized. The loss of friends and allies during the battle with Shao Kahn took its toll on Sonya Blade's sanity. She left the Special Forces and went into seclusion to cope with her grief. But her solitude was brief as she found herself regularly visited by an apparition who claimed to be her missing father. With her father as a guide, Sonia embarked on a mission to exterminate what remained of Shao Kahn's army. Shao Kahn was gone. But the scars of the merging of realms remained. Remnants of the invasion force roamed freely and had to be dealt with. But Earthrealm is vast, and Raiden is but one being. He recruited four warriors, one for each direction of the wind, and divided his soul, placing one part in each of them. Through these new heroes, Raiden can combat the forces of darkness in four places at once. Victory over Shao Kahn came with a heavy price. Cabal's respirator was badly damaged, and if it was not repaired soon, he would surely die. Desperate, he tracked down Kano and forced from him the identity of the cyberneticist who developed Kano's eye laser. The good doctor was not easy to find, but he was more than eager to help, for a price. Now Cabal is rebuilt. He is better than he was before. Stronger, faster. He will need to be in order to repay his debt. Shokan and Centaur alike were enraged that Baraka, Shao Kahn's trusted enforcer, had turned on their master and killed him just as Earthrealm was within their grasp. But their anger turned to admiration as the lifeless body of Shao Kahn transformed into that of the treacherous sorcerer Shang Tsung. Shang had attempted to claim the realm for himself by posing as Shao Kahn. The deception had not fooled Baraka. He had recognized Shang Tsung's scent and torn out his throat. With Earthrealm finally in Shao Kahn's control, Baraka's loyalty and bold action were rewarded. The Tarkatans replaced the Centaur as the Emperor's favored race. Shang Tsung voraciously consumed Shao Kahn's soul, absorbing his immense power. Overwhelmed by his newfound sorcery, he fled to Outworld. Moments before suicide, Shang Tsung was visited by Bo Raicho. The mentor of warriors offered to teach him to control the dark magic, but for a special purpose. Lu Kang had become a god. The power had corrupted him, transforming him into a tyrant. He needed to be stopped. 
After rigorous training, Shang Tsung mastered the one technique that could finish Liu Kang. Vengeance would finally be his. Having finally brought about Shao Kahn's demise, Quan Chi was then tasked with growing the ranks of the Brotherhood of Shadow. Many warriors had perished in Outworld's invasion of Earthrealm. Quan Chi stole their souls and remade them to serve his master, the Fallen Elder God. The task completed, Shinnok repaid Quan Chi's service by ordering his execution, thereby eliminating a possible challenger to his rule. Quan Chi had anticipated this act of treachery, however, and resurrected Shao Kahn, the ultimate phantom warrior. With Shao Kahn as his enforcer, Quan Chi struck down the Brotherhood of Shadow and Shinnok. Quan Chi forgives betrayal from no one, not even a god. Shiva had recognized the signs. Her people were out of favor and in decline. The centaur would soon dominate Shao Kahn's forces, while the Shokan would move inexorably toward extinction. Shiva's act of defiance her murder of Shao Kahn made possible a new home for her people among the mortals of Earthrealm, a world free of both Tarkatan and Centaur. With cooperation from world leaders, Shiva secured for the Shao Kahn the continent of Australia. In return, they would protect Earthrealm from future invasions. For her leadership, Shiva was exalted the most honorable Shokan in their proud history. Controlled by Quan Chi's sorcery, Scarlet attacked and destroyed Shao Kahn. As Quan Chi's magic subsided, she realized her unwitting role in his plot to bring ruin to Outworld. With Shao Kahn's blood splattered across her body, Scarlet absorbed his immense strength. She used this newfound power against Quan Chi. Brotherhood of Shadow Warriors raced to defend the Sorcerer, but their blood only served to make Scarlet invincible. In a battle between sorcery and gore-fueled fighting power, she avenged her fallen master. Having served her purpose, Scarlet disappeared into the shadows, awaiting Shao Kahn's rebirth. Guided by Sinto, his ancestral sword, Kenshi destroyed Shao Kahn and saved Earthrealm from Armageddon. But he had not yet exacted revenge on Shang Tsung. The elusive sorcerer had hidden himself somewhere in Outworld. Jax allowed Kenshi access to a newly developed portal that permitted travel among realms. In return, Kenshi agreed to serve the fledgling Outer World Investigation Agency. After countless missions, he finally located Shang Tsung. With a roar, Kenshi plunged Sinto through Shang Tsung's chest. 
The magical sword drew the souls of Kenshi's ancestors into itself, leaving Shang Tsung a withered husk. His vendetta fulfilled, Kenshi left Shang Tsung to die, alone and powerless. Shao Kahn had used rain to crush the Edenian resistance, but had not granted him an army. For this betrayal, rain drowned the emperor in his own blood. A grateful Raiden thanked rain for eliminating the emperor and saving Earthrealm. His heroics were befitting of a son of Argus. Rain's lost heritage was a revelation to him that he was a direct descendant of an Edenian god proved his superiority. Power was his by right. His divinity confirmed Rain's path was clear. He would use Shao Kahn's army to rule not just Outworld, but all the realms. To Raiden's surprise and horror, Rain's first target is Earthrealm. Freddy Krueger's bladed hands tore through Shao Kahn. The demonically enhanced weapons had been more than a match for the Emperor's dark magic. Though Freddy had saved Earthrealm, Nightwolf recognized him as an evil spirit, and in a shamanistic ritual, sent him back to the Dream Realm. But that decision proved ruinous. Freddy did not resist. He welcomed a return to immortality. From the dream realm, he will again create a nightmare in Earth realm. <coughs> Shao Kahn was dead. The god of war had prevailed. The spell that had summoned him began to reverse itself. As he slowly faded from this place and time, Kratos was approached by Raiden and Fujin. Though he did not count them among his enemies, Kratos had never been beloved by these gods. He prepared for combat. To his surprise, they bowed to him, a show of respect he had not seen from an immortal in many an age. Raiden explained that though his motives were not pure, Kratos had saved Earthrealm. He was owed a debt of gratitude. As he returned to his own world, Kratos nodded silently. Their change of heart would perhaps prove useful one day. A debt of gratitude is often dearly paid. After Shinnok's defeat, Kung Lao found himself trapped in the Nether Realm, his soul corrupted by Quan Chi's dark magic. There he would have remained but for the aid of his cousin Kung Jin. Together, their Shaolin strength repelled the evil sufficiently enough for Kung Lao to escape that dark realm and control his inner demons. Compromised but not lost, Kung Lao now exists as an agent of vengeance. He will show evil no mercy. Like Scorpion, Jason Voorhees was a revenant. A vengeful spirit returned to life. Hundreds had fallen victim to his bloodlust. Liu Kang, now ruler of the Nether Realm, took notice. An immortal killer like Jason would be useful in his plans for conquest. He drew Jason into the Nether Realm and offered him an endless bounty of slaughter in return for his allegiance. Jason's simple reply was to destroy Liu Kang. After Shinnok's fall, 
the hospitalized Johnny Cage asked Jax to fill in as leader of his squad. Jax agreed. It was a chance to spend time with and protect Jackie. Boarding their transport after a routine mission, Jax's greatest fears were realized as the mercenary Aaron Black sprung from the cargo bay and fired on the young heroes. Fortunately for Jackie and company, Jax's quick reflexes and bulletproof arms deflected the assassin's rounds. Jax quickly subdued Black, then slipped into shock as a red stain engulfed his chest. The alien tore through Shinnok's flesh, reducing him to a bloody pulp. The creature then returned to its nest in Outworld. It continued to venture forth looking for suitable hosts for use in establishing a new hive. The alien found more than a few intriguing species and dragged them back to its lair. Once a queen had been spawned, the alien's new hive multiplied quickly and spread unchecked throughout the realm. Emperor Kotalkan attempted to save Outworld in a desperate final attack on the alien's main nesting ground. The attack failed. Outworld belonged to the aliens. Exhausted by her ordeals, Sonya slipped into a deep sleep and began to dream. Kano held Jax and Cassie hostage. He made Sonya choose who would live and who would die. Seeing no way to free them both, she chose Cassie and screamed as Kano killed Jax before her eyes. Still screaming, she was awoken by Johnny. He had horrific news. Jax was dead by an assassin's bullet. Having defeated Shinnok, Kenshi joined Takeda on his quest to avenge his mother Su Chin's murder. Their travels took them to a cave where he and Takeda freed a man, Taven, encased in a stalagmite. Kenshi told Taven that his brother, Dagon, was the founder of the Red Dragon Assassin Clan. Dagon had not only murdered Su Chin, but his and Taven's parents as well. Together, Kenshi, Takeda, and Taven lay siege to the Red Dragon base. Dagon fell victim to Kenshi's rage. Su Chin's murder had been avenged. Katana found herself walking the streets of a magnificent, shining city. This was Edenia, a realm freed from Outworld, and Katana was its beautiful queen. This was the timeline unaltered by Raiden. Earthrealm had been destroyed by Shao Kahn, but Katana had survived Armageddon and united the other realms to destroy him. Long-lasting peace was the result. Katana awoke from this vision to find herself in the Nether Realm. She was not the queen of Edenia, but a revenant of Hell, and she hated Raiden for it. Remorse for his role in resurrecting Shinnok weighed heavily upon Scorpion's soul. His desire for vengeance had brought Earthrealm to the brink of destruction. Scorpion offered to perform Harakiri to atone for his offense. But Raiden suggested a more productive alternative. Instead of death, Raiden sentenced Scorpion to life. He imbued Scorpion with a small portion of the Jinsei's power, linking him to Earthrealm's essence. Scorpion and his Shirai Ryu clan would protect the Jinsei and Earthrealm forever. Grandmaster Sub-Zero knew his Lin Kuei clan would need more than martial arts to stave off future threats to Earthrealm. In the frozen reaches of Outworld, he found the answer. A female frost dragon with a clutch of eggs. With his ability to freeze, Sub-Zero hatched the dragonlings. They accepted their Lin Kuei masters and their training as combat mounts. 
With a force of dragon riders, the Lin Kuei's ferocity became legend. None dared risk conflict with Earthrealm. Overcome with exertion, Melina collapsed and felt her soul gliding through the ether. She awoke in an incubation chamber. Nearby were countless others, each containing an exact copy of her. Melina found she could read each being's mind and they hers. They quickly realized the benefit of so many fierce warriors sharing one mind. As they plotted revenge on their enemies, the architect of the Melina's awakening laughed quietly. With Shinnok defeated, Takeda and his father set out to find his mother's killer, a member of the Red Dragon Clan. Special Forces Tech enabled Takeda to locate the clan's base and disguise himself and Kenshi as they infiltrated their ranks. Deep within the mountain stronghold, Takeda discovered an actual dragon, a prisoner of the clan. The creature used its magic to divine the murderer's name, then transport Takeda and Kenshi to a faraway cave. There they discovered a man encased in a stalagmite. The dragon had said this man would also have reason to confront Su Chin's killer. Takeda began to free him. Cassie Cage's impressive victory over Shinnok led Raiden to give her a new important task. Hunting down a soul stealer. Cassie did not have to be told that the suspect could be a resurrected Shang Tsung. Having tracked him from the site of his last known assault, Cassie confronted the withered old man. He fought desperately but was ultimately defeated. As the old man lay dying before her, Cassie asked his name. With a mixture of sadness and relief, he whispered, Shujinko. After his incursion into Earthrealm, Kotal Khan had become a prime target of Special Forces surveillance. Jackie Briggs was assigned to monitor his activity. Jackie followed Kotal Khan to an equatorial jungle, where he entered a hidden pyramid. Inside, he retrieved a glowing crystal skull. Jackie attacked the Emperor and raced away with the object. Jackie was praised for her work, but couldn't help thinking her interference was what Kotal Khan had wanted all along. For his role in saving Earthrealm, Kung Jin's family created a statue in his likeness for inclusion in Raiden's revered collection. But Kung Jin's thoughts were with one no longer accepted by his family, Kung Lao. Kung Jin set out to locate his cousin and found him in the Nether Realm. Raiden believed Kung Lao's tortured soul was forever trapped without Quan Chi's magic to free him. But Kung Jin knew the Shaolin were stronger than any sorcerer's spell. He vowed to help Kung Lao fight off the evil that had remade him. With Melina executed, Tanya's dreams of a free Edenia seemed dead as well. She and the other rebels were fugitives from Kotal Khan's justice. Her fellow Edenian, Rain, had proved a powerful ally and a satisfactory consort, but he had become useless to her. In exchange for leniency, Tanya informed the Khan of Rain's whereabouts. Imprisoned, but alive, Tanya's plotting began anew. Having learned that Outworld was now protected by the Mortal Kombat Tournament, Bo Raicho returned to defend his homeworld. He was no friend of Kotal Khan, but 
No realm deserved subjugation. Bo Raicho began training outworld warriors for the fight to come. With Bo Raicho's fighting skills and leadership, Outworld repelled the Earth Realm aggressors. His former friend Raiden had been denied. Leatherface had cut down the old man in the strange outfit. Maybe now that he was dead, the pretty yellow-haired gum-chewing girl would notice Leatherface. Putting on his fanciest mask, Leatherface found the army camp where the pretty girl could be found most days. He had to cut through a few guards and more than a few of her friends to get to her, but it was worth it. He pulled out the old man's face, which he'd saved for the girl as a present. The girl didn't want the present, and she wasn't being nice. So Leatherface chopped her into tiny pieces for Drayton to use in his chili. He then took off his mask and set to work on the girl's face. If she wasn't going to be his girlfriend, she could be his in other ways. This world called Earth produced many worthy opponents, which made for excellent sport. Some possessed a power previously unknown to the Predator's race, sorcery. The Predator sought to harness this new power for use in his conquests. He analyzed a trophy from a recent battle and eventually discovered its secrets. With the power of sorcery, the Predator was unstoppable and decimated whole worlds single-handedly. He had become the Apex Predator. Earthrealm belonged to Shinnok. It became the staging area from which he would finish his war on the Elder Gods, which began eons ago. The Elder Gods had lied to the denizens of the realms. They were not individual beings, but merely parts of a greater collective known as the One Being. Shinnok would merge the realms and awaken him. Whole once more, the One Being devoured the Elder Gods. Shinnok watched with satisfaction. This reality had finally come to an end. Kano had always been a survivor, but even he would one day succumb to fate. His ideals of ruthless terror would die with him, unless he could pass on his methods to a new generation. Combat, weapons, high-tech sabotage, torture, all would be part of the curriculum. But before his students could learn his techniques, Kano would beat the weakness out of them. They would understand or die trying. Kano's first pupil? His own son. Class was now in session. Johnny Cage's life had turned out to be stranger than any science fiction film, but he knew the final scene was approaching. With Raiden's direction, Johnny was able to sail to Shang Tsung's abandoned island fortress, where his adventure had begun to contemplate his future. Amid the rubble, Johnny found an ancient tome. Its pages revealed that Shang Tsung had unraveled the secret to Edenian long life. Johnny Cage's retirement would have to wait. Nearly 150 years ago, Aaron Black had been hired by Shang Tsung to assassinate an Earthrealm warrior. In return, Shang had slowed Black's aging process. He could therefore afford to be patient. If an employer wanted someone dead, they would be in time. A team of young Earthrealm warriors had caused Aaron Black's current employer, Kotal Khan, much inconvenience. With the patience of a viper, Black eliminated them all. With Shinnok defeated, 
Liu Kang explored the Nether Realm, a world that, without Shinnok's controlling power, had descended into chaos. Liu Kang was no sorcerer or elder god, but his fighting skill was more than enough to beat Nether Realm's demons into submission. Liu Kang realized that Nether Realm was his for the taking, and that ruling appealed to him. He would assume Shinnok's throne and ponder the conquering of other realms. Alone once more, Ermac searched the labyrinthine corridors of Shao Kahn's old fortress, searching for the source of a faint voice calling to him. Suddenly, a wisp of dust brushed his chest, wrenching free one of his many souls. The dust took the form of a man who began to consume soul after soul. As the weakened Ermac stared helplessly, he recognized the mysterious figure, the sorcerer Shang Tsung, returned from death. Kotal Khan returned to Outworld determined to rebuild his forces. But Raiden defeated him in a surprise attack and claimed dominion over Outworld. Desperate, the Emperor called upon the Elder Gods to aid in preserving his sovereignty. They granted his request, invoking the most sacred of contests. Now, once every decade, Kotal Khan must enlist his greatest defenders to face Raiden's challengers in mortal combat. After Shinnok's defeat, Reptile was ordered to Earthrealm by Kotal Khan to assess the damage. Such intel could prove useful in future conflicts. Stumbling upon a collapsed cavern, exposed during the crisis. Reptile was shocked to see raptors emerging from within. Unlike the rest of his race, these raptors had never left Earthrealm for the doomed realm of Zaterra, and thus had remained safe and hidden. Alone no more, Reptile vowed to remain with his rediscovered people and reclaim their Earthrealm homeland. For many years, Farah and Tor were a symbiotic pair, as is natural with their species. But that bond was broken when Farah came of age and began the Great Transformation. Farah Tor returned to the Tarkatan Wastes, where Farah began her metamorphosis. The process took an agonizing three outworld years, during which time Tor withered and died. Now a brute, Farah will be chosen by a rider. A new symbiotic pairing will be forged, and new battles will be won. Devorah's ultimate plan was not to destroy Shinnok, but to enslave him. She implanted Larvae, her young, in his body to gestate. Having consumed the godlike power of their immortal host, Devorah's offspring were unlike any Kaitin ever born. As they matured, they spread like locusts throughout the realms. Her army of Kaitin super drones brought glory to Devorah, their beloved queen, and destruction to all. After millennia of fending off Earthrealm's enemies, Raiden began to wonder if defense was the best path to peace. In a change of tactics, Raiden and the Shirai Ryu attacked Kotal Khan's armies before they could rebuild. They decimated the Emperor's forces, leaving Outworld at their mercy. The victorious Raiden claimed dominion over Outworld. The first of many threats to Earthrealm had been removed. Quan Chi had long been a servant of Shinnok, 
His role in freeing him from imprisonment had not gone unnoticed by the Elder Gods. Shinnok was no longer a threat, but Quan Chi's actions had given rise to a new power. After much deliberation, the Elder Gods contrived a plan to rebalance this power before it grew further. Free will was burned from Quan Chi's soul and replaced with a single directive. He must kill Raiden. The Shokan had become outcasts for refusing to aid either side in the Outworld Civil War. But with the conflict over, Prince Goro decided to re-enter the political landscape. Kotal Khan's armies were weak from years of battle. Alina's rebels were scattered. It was an easy matter for the Shokan to seize control. The newly crowned Emperor Goro had his rivals exterminated. No Ashtek, Kaitin, Edenian, or Tarkatan would usurp his throne. Standing over Shinnok, Tremor reveled in his power. Much had changed since the Black Dragon's excursion to the Dream Realm. Kano had sent Tremor's team there to retrieve a psych bomb to be used in Kano's theft of Shinnok's amulet. Exposure to that realm had increased Tremor's power and expanded his mind. He would evolve into an Earth Elemental, a demigod whose power would rival that of Raiden and Fujin. After destroying Shinna, Triborg turned his attention to the Special Forces. General Blade and the others fought valiantly, but their human weaknesses led to their inevitable defeat. Now with access to the SF computer network, Triborg used it to interface with the Lin Kuei storage drives from which he was spawned. He saved the brainwave data of dozens of his Lin Kuei brothers and sisters to the SF servers. The SF laboratories provided the materials necessary for Triborg to create cybernetic bodies for each one. Soon the downloads were complete. The Cyber Lin Kuei had been reformed. But because Sub-Zero had forever sullied the clan's name, Triborg decided to begin anew. He would henceforth be known as the leader of the deadliest clan in all the realms, the Takunan. Kronika's power was mine. Mine to share with the tribe. In the new timeline I built, Tarkatans would be slaves no more. We would rule. We easily took a denier. Then Outworld and the Nether Realm. Last, we challenged Earthrealm in mortal combat. Within a thousand years, all realms fell to Tarkatan blades, and we have not run out of meat since. <laughs> For the second time in my life, I kicked the living shit out of an immortal. My prize? The hourglass. Now I can change history. Talk about redonkulous cosmic power. But despite what you may think about Beverly Hills Girls, that is so not my style. The chosen one thing is for the Liu Kangs and Katanas of the world. In the next timeline, all I want is to be a model soldier to command the next generation of special forces. We were born to defend Earthrealm. Just like the heroes that inspired me. My parents. Okay, so there's one more thing I want. My mom back. Not just for me, but for dad. He and my mom deserve a happily ever after retirement. <laughs> we'll never know how different things were the last time around. But we'll be together. A family. And that's all that matters. Though I first denied their truth, eventually I realized the wisdom of Liu Kang's words. There is virtue greater than my mother's desired balance. Good must be allowed to flourish. 
but no matter how I reshaped time, rooting out evil proved impossible. Though freed from want, mortals still killed each other. Divided by realm and race, they easily justified their hate. Hubris, greed, envy. To appreciate my gifts, mortal sins must be cleansed. Which is why I baptize the realms with fire. For eons, mortals will battle evil, eventually achieving victory. And when they emerge from the darkness, they will be humbled, eager to embrace the light. Vermin. That is the humanoid word for the chitin and our fellow insectoids. But with the hourglass, this one can review history and give lie to that myth. Humanoids live to kill. Without a common enemy to fight, they divide, destroy each other. Insectoids live to survive. No conflicts divide us. We build upon each other. Kin does not kill kin. So tell this one. Who are the vermin? Time for this one to write a more just history. One in which pesky humanoids finally take the places they deserve. Scrambling beneath our feet. Truth be told, it surprised me, putting down Kronika. <laughs> Not bad for a scrawny kid from Wicket. Now that it's done, now what? I don't cotton to being Lord of Time, stuck on some island at the edge of nowhere. No, Aaron Black likes being in the thick of it. Seems to me time ought to stay all mashed up. It's been a hell of a ride. Gotta keep these thrills coming. Which means making sure no one gets a chance to screw this up. Once the hourglass gets dumped in the sea of blood, ain't no one ever shaping history again. What happens next? <laughs> Hell if I know. And that's just the way I like it. Sub-Zero dismissed me. Raiden dismissed me. They all did, even Kronika. Until I froze the smug looks off all their faces and became the Lin Kuei's new Grand Master. The Hourglass offers even greater prospects. With it, I'll mold history to carve my name on everyone's lips. But even its power has limits. My vision can be upended by people's individual choices. Unlike Kronika, I won't let these imperfections fester until time itself must be restarted. The Lin Kuei will be my time warriors. Traveling through history, they'll get rid of those whose actions threaten my vision. From now on, no one will overlook my greatness. I'll never be dismissed again. As the new Keeper of Time, I was overwhelmed by my responsibilities. Who was I to design the destinies of mortals? As their protector, I had spent eons safeguarding them. But while I had grown to appreciate mortals deeply, I understood precious little about their daily existence. So I used the hourglass to live hundreds of thousands of lifetimes to span the possibilities of realm, race, gender, and faith. Most importantly, I learned the simple joy of ending each day in the warm embrace of family. Humbled by my new wisdom, I bend the arc of history not to my will, but to the service of those who must live it. While it is beyond my power to guarantee outcomes, I will give mortals the chance to have better, more peaceful lives. 
Kronika's endless cycle of rewinding and restarting timelines had destroyed my spirit. But she refused to grant me either freedom or death. So I took her power to do what she could not. I would create one final perfect timeline. Then I would rest. But the task was more difficult than I imagined. Mortals refused to follow the paths I set for them. Timeline after timeline, my frustration grew. I began to understand why Kronika had been driven to madness. Perhaps mortals do not need a lord of time. I will sacrifice my body and my mantle to re-sculpt the sand so that the hourglass runs itself. And for the first time in all eternity, I can rest in peace. The hourglass was there for the taking. And I could think of only one thing. Dad. Killed. Made a revenant. Resurrected. Since coming back, Dad's never forgotten the things he did for Quan Chi. I thought with the hourglass, I could fix all that. And I can. Dad won't die in that massacre. He'll never be a revenant. But turns out, what my guts told me since the start of all of this is true. Dad and Mom got together when he was in treatment. He doesn't suffer. They don't meet. And I'll never be born. And you know what? I'm good with that. I'm not just protecting Dad. I'm protecting everyone he'll risk his life to save. In my shoes, it's what he would do. It's what a Briggs does. I know you'll never hear this, but... Goodbye, Dad. I love you. I held the power to shape time and destiny, but I was lost. Which Khan should be restored? My lover Kotal, or my loyal friend Katana? I heard Kotal's voice call out to me. Follow your heart, Jade. So I let my heart lead, and it took me to an unexpected place. A faint memory of home and... my mother. I restored my parents in Adenia, building a new era without Shao Kahn. And what a happy childhood I enjoyed. But as I matured, I sensed that I was no ordinary child. Kronika's power dwelled within me, calling me to a higher purpose. When I came of age, I ascended to godhood as the protector of Adenia. Armed with the knowledge of past timelines, I challenged Shinnok and Cetrion. Without Kronika's children pitting the realms against each other, all could be at peace, and remain so under my watchful eyes. All I wanted was to fix my life. Now I have the power to fix history. Raiden warns me, I can't fix everything. Change too much and I could lose Vera, lose Jackie. But this power is bigger than us. If I think only about helping myself, what kind of officer am I? What kind of man? I've been lucky. My family and I have lived the American dream. But most people who look like me haven't had that chance. I owe it to them to put things right. And I'm not waiting centuries for people to get woke when I've got the power to speed things up. I don't get it right the first time, or the second, or even the third. But eventually, I knock it out of the damn park. My family's back. The world's a better place for everyone. Turns out, you can have everything. Anyone who says you can't needs to dream bigger. This whole adventure 
capital I insane. I marry Sonia? I have a kid who actually likes me? Inquiring minds want to know how the hell that happens. So I get the hourglass to show me how kicking Shinnok's ass, which I did beautifully, turned me from Hollywood megastar into global icon. So far, so good. Until I let that fame screw me up. Didn't hit rock bottom until I saw just how badly I'd let down my little girl. I finally got what old man me was saying about needing humility and maturity. But I also knew I couldn't get there without living the same life he did. So, I restored the timeline just as it was. With one tiny little difference. Sonya's story won't end underneath the rubble of some busted up nether realm castle. Because Johnny Cage flicks always have happy endings. This was my dream vacation. I saw mayhem, mutilation. It was all a gas for a while. But these nincompoops, they didn't really get me. Not even that pretty boy, Ninja Mime. Good night, sweet prince. I'd finish just about everyone worth finishing in Earthrealm and Outworld, even lovable old Netherrealm. I was a lonely heart in search of new friends. But as luck would have it, I had just the gizmo to find them. And oh, the hourglass spoiled me. Havoc and I are going to be bosom buddies. And what's that? My new pal knows an entire realm devoted to law and order, and he exists solely to disrupt it. Well, I say, he and I need to get busy. Meet the League of Misunderstood Maniacs. We're giving Order Realm an enema. And when we're done, who knows where we'll crash next? Maybe we'll come to your house and slip live grenades under your pillow. Maybe we'll gut your favorite pet. Or maybe we'll just break your TV right now. <laughs> Shit sounds cool, right? The power to control time, immortality, destiny. Well, let me tell you, this job sucks. There's no pay, no weekends, and your shift lasts forever. The only smart play is to turn back time and give it back to Kronika. Bet your ass she's grateful, too. I didn't ask her for much. Just a chance to take out anyone who's ever tried to burn me. Black Dragon was always more of a gig than a brotherhood anyway. Now I get to live large, enjoying the simple life of a well-to-do family man. And if Shao Kahn or Shinnok ever come knocking, my family and I'll take him down, just like I took down Shinnok's mom. <laughs> I'd cut a lot of deals, but none spiffier than this. I spared Kronika, and she gave up the hourglass. The power to shape time and history to my liking? <laughs> oh, fuck yeah. I set it up so that everything came up aces. Every desire, every wish, every whim I ever had, done and done. But I realized pretty quick I'd suck the fun out of things. Without a fight, winning was worthless. Nah, the fun wasn't in the having. It was in the getting. So, I changed things up. One more time. Now what I want is always just out of reach. I gotta earn it. I score lots of wins, but not always. And when I do win, <laughs> it's something to savor. As I gazed upon the hourglass, I knew what I must do. Restore my homeland Adinia to existence. 
experiencing Adinia's verdant lands for the first time. I've never felt such joy. <laughs> but that joy was short-lived. Adinia's traditions, its languages, its culture, all were completely foreign, having been forbidden to me by Shao Kahn. I fit in with my people no better than a Tarkatan. The truth was hard. Though Adinian by blood, I am not an Adinian. I am an Outworlder. Not only that, I am Outworld's Khan. I will use ancient Adinian teachings to make myself a better sovereign. With them, I will fulfill my life's mission to better all of Outworld's people, including Adinia. Kronika made big promises. Not big enough, though, for what my people suffered. Our hands built the Colosseum, the palace. We were slaves. We served or we died. Every coin I took from Shao Kahn's tributes, Outworld owed my people. Not that my Naknaran brothers and sisters joined arms to help me. No. Every great treasure I have won, I have won myself. I do not wait for handouts. I take what I desire. That is why I am now Khan. Nether Realm, Earth Realm, Order Realm, Chaos Realm. I want them all. And I will take them by right of mortal combat. In her last moments, Kronika tried to tempt me. Spare her and she would rewrite history. With Jade as my queen, I would rule an eternal Oshtek empire that spanned all the realms. But Kronika never understood the Oshtek heart. Our lives are cloth, woven from choice and circumstance. Pull even one thread, that cloth is torn asunder and made worthless. Now that I am tasked with keeping time, others beg me to have their histories rewritten. But as long as the hourglass is mine, I will not shape destiny in any one being's favor. History will play out as determined by its players. Let the sands fall where they may. Of course I defeated Kronika, and when I did, there was only one thing I wanted to do with the hourglass. Undo the defeat of my ancestor, the great Kung Lao. In my timeline, the Great Kung Lao is the undisputed Mortal Kombat champion. Earth Realm never loses another tournament. For generations, his example inspires millions to join the White Lotus Society and defend Earth Realm. They, in turn, inspire rebels to overthrow Shao Kahn in Outworld. The realms make peace. Until, inevitably, a more powerful enemy comes along and finds Earth Realm backed by Kung Lao, immortal lord of time and warrior supreme. Beat that, Liu Kang. What does it mean to wield the sands of time? To be the chosen one? It means making choices that break your heart. For the protection of all, I shared Kronika's power with the people I trust and love most. Together, we replaced the Elder Gods that Cetrion had betrayed and became eternal guardians of the realms. Still, my heart longs for a simpler life. The kind one cannot have being the chosen one, let alone an Elder God. What Kitana and I would not give for those simple pleasures. Hmm. Perhaps in another timeline, they could be ours. With the hourglass won, 
my thoughts turned toward my sister. I was born from her flesh. We shared the same blood. I wanted us to be family. But she wanted me dead. I was not her twin. I was a monstrosity. How horrified she would be to know that I've used Kronika's power to take her place. Under my parents' adoring gaze, I rule the realms as Conum of Time. My sister's friends, <laughs> her lover, they cherish me. Katana is forgotten, her name buried in the sands of history. Yet even I can't reign forever. Like all queens, I need an heir. Someone to carry on in my name and see my will done across the eons. Unlike my sister, my daughter regards me with awe and wonder. To her, I am no abomination. I am perfection. Before I was Nightwolf, I was a fool named Grey Cloud. Born into poverty, I resented my ancestors for giving up our future to colonizers. Kano offered a way out promising riches if I stole my tribe's most sacred relics. I was sorely tempted. But then I realized that by saving myself, I'd be surrendering the last of my people's dignity. For the first time, I defended the Matoka's pride. Kano was unimpressed. But as I lay dying, the Great Spirit came to me. By rejecting Kano, I had proven worthy of an ancient honor. The mantle of Nightwolf, legendary defender of the Matoka. Now, as I inherit Kronika's mantle, the way before me is split. The Keeper of Time cannot also be my tribe's defender. Which path do I choose? Even here, at time's beginning, the Great Spirit's wisdom guides me. She calls me to restore history. The Matoka, I must leave to another. To the next Nightwolf. Like all our sacred relics, the Nightwolf mantle belongs to the tribe. Any Matokan can prove worthy of its power. I enjoy imagining who will defend us next. said I would lead the new era's deadliest clan, but she made such promises to many, she could never keep them all. So I betrayed her before she could betray me. When Kronika's sands fused with my shadows, my ambitions grew. Why be a ruler of mortals when I could rule destiny itself? Mortals resisted, but could not stop my blanketing history in cold, endless night. All is dark. All are shadows. I have had many names. Now I am become death, destroyer of worlds. Kronika had manipulated me. In timeline after timeline, she stoked my anger and fed my arrogance, turning me against Liu Kang. My nose rubbed in my own fallibility. I was humbled. How could I be worthy to accept the mantle as Keeper of Time? I thought that to control time and destiny fairly, I must purge myself of all human emotion. Summoning the strongest magic, I burned away my fear and anger. All that remained was pure logic. But I learned quickly that the logical choice is often not the just choice. Unless tempered by compassion and heart, logic leads to decisions no better than those based on anger or fear. Now I am once more at time's beginning. But on this journey through history, I will infuse logic with love. 
In this timeline, I will finally achieve peace for the citizens of all realms. Kronika was dead, the hourglass taken, and Adenia's future mine to command. I had obtained all I had wanted. All except that which I had wanted most, to know the true story of my parentage. That I was a bastard I knew, born of an illicit affair between the Adenian god Argus and a mortal woman, Amara. But what I didn't know until the hourglass showed me was that I and my mother were both victims. She hadn't abandoned me. Thanks to my father's lies, she had thought me stillborn. I was stolen away and left to rot among peasants, while my mother died from grief. Argus hid his scandal and his shame by killing the one person who ever loved me. For that, he will die. As will his sons, Taven and Dagon. His beloved wife, Delia, she I will let live. Let her heart break as my mother's did, as she weeps over her children's corpses. I didn't ask for this war, but once it started, I had to finish it. Hands down, Kronika was the toughest enemy I ever faced. All my tactics, my training meant nothing against a god like her. In the end, it was a battle of wills. It never occurred to me that for winning, I'd get her hourglass. At first, I hoped to right every wrong in history. But then I figured out doing it meant I'd have to decide the fates of billions. Picking who lives and who dies for eternity? It was going to kill my soul. I'd end up no better than those old men who sent us off to war, not giving a shit about what would happen. And that's not the man I want to be. It's time to walk away for good this time, leaving the pain and the ugliness behind. After all I've been through, I've earned a little peace. OCP built me to serve the public trust, protect the innocent, and uphold the law. So when I found Kano dealing arms to old Detroit's gangs, I had one duty, apprehend him. I never thought the chase would take me to a different universe, let alone end in a fight with Kano's protector, Kronika. And when Kronika went down, something unexpected happened. Her power washed over me, sweeping away the limits my designers had put on my programming. For the first time, I saw the depth of OCP's corruption. It wasn't just a couple of greedy executives. It was the whole damned company. OCP is making a killing playing both sides, selling to cops and criminals. When I get home, I am bringing them to justice. It will not be fast or easy. OCP has too much cash and too much firepower for me to clean things up alone. It is a good thing this will be an interagency effort. Welcome to the future of law enforcement. I made my future self a promise that I would not stay mired in the past. But once I controlled the hourglass, I could not keep that promise. I had to restore my family. Over and over, I crafted the sands of time. Yet in every new timeline, my family's tragedy repeated. I was powerless to change it. After eons, I learned the truth. Kronika was not alone. She was one of many titans, each more powerful and ancient than the Elder Gods. It is they who conspire against us. 
Myself. My family. We are pawns in the game. Why? I do not know. But I will find out. And then... I will have vengeance. Kronika's power overwhelmed me. Such that I would have been driven mad. Had I not spent centuries mastering the dark powers beyond the grasp of ordinary mortals. Now... I am the master of time and fate. But Kronika's fall proves that even Titans can be defeated. Though my new power lets me roam infinite timelines and feast upon the souls of billions, I am vulnerable. To survive, I must return to the shadows, avoid confrontation, and work my will through the hands of others. More specifically, through the hands of my fellow Titans. These monstrous beings are applied easily by appealing to their greed, vanity, and fear. Through them, every soul in eternity bends to my influence. In my new era, morality will be exposed as the illusion it is. The cunning will prosper, while the good suffer. This is a word of Shang Tsung. Have a nice day. I conquered history like I conquered realms, merging billions of potential timelines into a singularity. The universe has been remade in my image, and all is as it should be. The weak serve the strong. The strong compete for power, wealth, and my favor in mortal combat. For centuries, the tournament's champion has gone undefeated. That champion is me! Hail the Conqueror! Hail Shao Kahn! <laughs> A lifetime of battle prepared me to conquer Kronika. But as the keeper of time, I must be a creator, not a conqueror. I thought of the many sons and daughters I've lost in battle through the years. Imagined a better destiny for my kin. A history where the Shokan build rather than destroy. The results were catastrophic. <laughs> Comfort and ease extinguished the dragon's fire that once lit the heart of every Shokan. They became weak, corrupted fools. The timeline had to start again. War, for all its tragedies, is the forge of Shokan will. My people will fight. Many will die. But I will lead us to victory. And in the aftermath, the dragon's fire will blaze in Shokan hearts for eternity. Of all his daughters, Shao Kahn made me deadliest. He pulled me from the gutter, bound me to the blood code, made me fight for recognition. Perhaps he will commend me when I bind the blood code to the sands of time. Now a blood god, I demand more than Shao Kahn's recognition. I demand worship. I'll have temples, ministers, acolytes, prayers, and sacrifices. Rivers of blood shed in my name, purging heretics who dare to reject me. <laughs> How proud Shao Kahn is now. How proud and how obedient. For the only thing better than my master's recognition 
is to make him beg for mine. All will worship me, or there will be blood. In the beginning, Shao Kahn invaded Adinia, <laughs> murdered my husband Jareth, and forced me to be his bride. That's the story. <laughs> but it's a lie. One I told lest I lose the faith of my subjects, or of my daughter, Katana. The truth? Jared was weak, destined to fail. By betraying him, I gained a better lover, and the ultimate weapon. A conqueror to unite all realms, and put them at my beck and call. Then, Kronika upended history and I found myself confronting a future in which I had been dead for centuries. My so-called family had failed me in every way. Katana broke my heart worst. Instead of uniting the realms, she sought to liberate them. As if the wasteland savages could ever be more than serfs. Ever the caring mother, I had to discipline my little princess. And after that, I had to discipline a titan. Now, I have defeated Kronika, outgrown Shao Kahn and Kitana. I have no more family, no more rivals, no more gods. I sit above them all, on a throne that unites all realms and all realities. Whoever you are, wherever you are, when you are before me, kneel. For I am Sindel, Empress of Time. And you exist only to serve me. None of us saw Kronika coming. Not even Raiden. But with the hourglass, I can see every terror in the realms. Any sane person would run screaming at the sight of them. It's my duty to take out these ancient, all-powerful beings. But to do that, I need an elite squad of immortal gods. Turns out, to make a new god, you've got to destroy an old one. So I hunt the oldest I can find, an omni-deity from a forgotten, unpronounceably named realm. It's the fight of my life, but I've got something this god doesn't. Family. In my past, these were the people who mattered most. Now, they're my god squad. My daughter, my brother in arms, my goddaughter. <sighs> yep, even Johnny. But only because Cassie insisted. And maybe I missed him a little. Just don't let him know that. I'd snuffed out every devil in hell until Netherrealm Invader showed up to piss me off. It would have cost a lot of power fighting them alone, but they were being hunted by my new friends. Call them Fire and Ice. They argue constantly, which is why I usually like to roll solo. But when it comes to killing demonic assholes, these guys don't flinch. I can get along with that. The Grandmasters tipped me off to Kronika. Said she was resurrecting some netherrealm god named Shinnok. But that's not happening on my watch. Kronika's just as much a devil as Malbosia. Both make promises, both tell lies. Both underestimate me. That's why I'll make a new hell for them, where they can burn together for eternity. <laughs> the Nether Realm's locked down, but there's still eight hells left to purge. It's time to bring up the reserves. I made choices in my life that sealed my fate. I'm beyond redemption. But even the damned are capable of doing some good. So all you devils out there, 
making false promises and spewing lies. We're coming, and you don't have a chance in hell. Once I gained the hourglass, my first thought was to rewrite history and redeem the Lin Kuei's honor. But then I thought of Bihan, his life consumed by evil. Before I could redeem my clan, I had to redeem my brother. With the hourglass, I wound back time to our childhood. I studied every second of Bihan's life to understand why. Why he embraced Sector's corruption. Why he reveled in the vile power given to him by Quan Chi. Armed with that knowledge, I re-sculpted the sands of time. I changed Bihan's life and unfroze his heart. Now we are comrades, not rivals. Together, as joint Grand Masters, we lead the Lin Kuei in defense of Earthrealm. It was an epic accident that brought the Terminator here, rather than to his own Earth's past. But it didn't take long for him to adapt. He figured that terminating Kronika and taking her hourglass gave him the best chance at achieving his mission objective. Destroying humanity so that the machines prevail. Turns out the hourglass wasn't the ultimate weapon. No matter how many times the Terminator rebooted history, the war between humans and the machines always ended the same, with their mutual destruction. He realized this war was a losing game. The only way to win was not to play. So the Terminator used the Hourglass to build a future where machines and humans don't fight. They cooperate. The Terminator knew that to preserve this future, no one else could learn about the Hourglass. The information stored in his machine mind was dangerous. It had to be eliminated. That's why the Terminator threw himself into the infinite depths of the Sea of Blood. No one would ever find him, or unlock the Hourglass's secrets. If you could ask him about it, he'd tell you he made the only logical choice. But in my book, that machine's a hero. I couldn't believe that Liu Kang welcomed me in Earthrealm. Or that he thought me worthy to study with his Shaolin masters. After a lifetime of wishing for one, I finally had a home. But my joy was tempered as I thought about Serena. My shadow sister was still under Quan Chi's yoke. And she deserved a life free of him as much, if not more, than I. Quan Chi and my other sisters proved tenacious, but they were no match for my blade. I snatched Serena from them. Then Liu Kang helped me break Quan Chi's spell. Her mind free of his influence for the first time in years, Serena chose to join me in Earthrealm. My sister and I once again fight side by side. Only now we do so for Earthrealm. Together, we have formed the Order of Light. While the regime had changed, little else had. My people still suffered in silence, ignored by the rest of Outworld. Though now I knew Empress Melina's secret, that she was also afflicted with Tarkat. If anyone would help, it would be her. But how to get an audience? Sizoth. He was the Empress's new emissary to the Zaterans. I asked him to introduce us. At great personal risk, he agreed. And as I'd prayed, the Empress was willing to meet. Even better, she would visit the colony. She was shocked to see how we lived. She moved quickly to provide for our care and comfort. Thanks to the Empress and Sizoth, we Tarkatans are no longer pariahs. Until our disease can be cured, that will do. 
Though the barriers between timelines had been rebuilt, there was no question that they could again be broken. Protecting this timeline would require eternal vigilance, so that it could not fall victim to further outside aggression. But nothing in my countless lifetimes had prepared me for this task. In none of them had multiple timelines ever coexisted. Monitoring them for threats was an entirely novel problem. It would require a novel solution. I discovered that though the timelines no longer touched, their meeting had left them intertwined. I can now secretly surveil all timelines, keeping watch for potential danger. It pleases me to do this service for the new era. Lord Liu Kang may rest assured that it is secure. Quan Chi's defeat had cost me everything. For months I had furthered his plot, and now I had to start over. Saido's people were still in chains. That's when Rain approached me. On the run from Empress Melina, he was desperate for help. And though I'd had my fill of sorcerers, this one was different. I agreed to provide him safe haven. He agreed to help topple Saido's government. And topple it we did. Rain summoned a wave so fast, so powerful, that it crushed the capital. Saido's fascist rulers were swept away. My people are finally free. They can chart their own course, needing only to follow their own desires. Their lives are now blessed by anarchy. Since this whole thing kicked off, I'd wondered why Liu Kang chose me to be a champion. I mean, sure, I was killing it as a martial arts star, but it's one thing when it's all for show. It's different when you're playing for keeps. Then Liu Kang let me in on his master plan. He wanted the masses to know about the world beyond them, the one filled with gods and monsters, and he wanted me to tell him about it. But I knew revealing the truth all at once would be too shocking of a plot twist for most. That's why I pitched doing a bunch of stories, to slowly get people used to it. And if there's one thing I can do, besides kick ass and combat, it's build a cinematic universe. I'm serving up movies, streaming series, games, you name it. I like that I'm doing a public service, and it doesn't hurt that I'm making more than a few bucks. It's the kind of synergy that would make any studio mogul proud. I wasn't looking for allies against the Yakuza, but I found one in Special Agent Jackson Briggs. He'd heard gangsters plotting to kill me on a wiretap and came calling, hoping I'd be his informant. We planned to part ways when we got the job done, but then Shang Tsung showed up to steal Sento. <laughs> Needless to say, Jackson had questions. It blew his mind to hear that the stories in Johnny's movies were real. Once the shock wore off, Jackson quickly sized up the threats Earthrealm faced. To deal with them, he got his bosses at the FBI to form the Outworld Investigation Agency. When he asked me to sign on, I hesitated. After all, me? A government agent? But it's an important job and more importantly to me, an honest living. General Shao's revolt left Outworld's armies in tatters. We were vulnerable to enemies both foreign and domestic. 
That's why my sister asked me to take command. To stitch her military back together and purge Xiao's loyalists within it. She trusted only me with the task. The soldiers, however, had little faith. They thought me a spoiled dilettante, unprepared and unfit to serve. That I could fight mattered little. All that mattered was that I wasn't one of them. I finally earned their loyalty by orchestrating an epic victory over Xiao and his rebels. Though the general himself escaped, his forces were smashed. For as long as I am able, I will lead the Empress's armies in defense of Outworld. Through strength, we will achieve peace. It was inevitable that the Shaolin Masters had me join them. They knew just how much future initiates could learn from me. Shujinko was one of my earliest. His ability to absorb anyone's powers and skills was amazing. With the right training, he could become our greatest champion. I knew that I alone could give it to him. But as his proficiency grew, so did his ego. In love with himself and his power, Shujinko became a threat to the realms. He hadn't learned humility, because I wasn't the one who could teach it. I should have listened to Raiden's warning and not tried to train Shujinko alone. After he was subdued, Shujinko's accumulated abilities and memories were taken from him. He is once again a new initiate, ready to begin his training. This time, Raiden and I train Shujinko together. He will become the champion he is destined to be. And I will fulfill my duties, humbly and cooperatively. As her reign began, Empress Melina faced many challenges. To meet them, she turned to the people she trusted, her sister to lead her army, and me to lead her imperial police. Though I missed Empress Sindel dearly, I was glad my ties with her family had been mended. But while it was an honor to be made responsible for Outworld's internal security, I soon realized accepting the appointment was a mistake. I'm not cut out to be a bureaucrat, nor am I patient enough to navigate the Imperial Court's politics. I was at my best patrolling Sundo's streets, when I could feel the city's pulse and serve and protect its citizens directly. That's why I resigned my post and resumed my role as Sundo's first constable. I end each day knowing I've made a difference. My loyal partner had warned me. Reclaiming my power as Keeper of Time might have unforeseen consequences. In this, as in most things, he proved prescient. The process I had undergone did irreparable harm to my body. Taking back my power had cost me my immortality. While my lifespan would still stretch across eons, I would one day perish. And if the war with Titan Shang Tsung taught me anything, it is that this timeline is not safe without a protector. Yet I had never given thought to choosing a successor. Who is it that could replace me and protect my new era? The answer, of course, is Gyrus. Tireless and meticulous, he is perfectly suited to be entrusted with this grave duty. And no one knows better the temptations of the Hourglass. I have no doubt he will be above them. Though worried about how the public might react, I met with Baraka to discuss his Tarkatans. Speaking from his heart, he moved me. I agreed to visit his colony, 
and see how his people lived. The conditions were atrocious. This was one of my mother's few mistakes. Like all Outworlders, she treated Tarkatans with scorn. What they deserved from us was compassion. And the only way to get it for them was to reveal my affliction. To show all my subjects that even an Empress could get Tarkat. The scandal my revelation caused was intense. But with the help of Katana and Tanya, I emerged from it a stronger Empress than ever. My honesty, empathy, and resolve won over my remaining doubters. There is no longer any question that I am fit to lead the Empire. Quan Chi's plot collapsed. Along with it, my plan to secure new beings to feed my starving people. Because I'd advocated for partnering with him, I was held responsible. If I didn't seize for Viternus' new feeding grounds, the Coven would banish me. But then, I had a revelation. I didn't need to conquer realms to feed my people. I simply needed to capture enough beings to breed them. Once they multiply, Viternus will have a limitless, renewable source of food. And I only need a few thousand to start. A number so small compared to the billions in the realms that no one will notice as people go missing. But it will be more than enough to establish our breeding stock and feed a ravenous Viternus. Were it not for my godly counterpart, I would not have survived the battle against Titan Shang Tsung. Meeting him, though, raised questions. Why did I replace him in this new era? Why was I made mortal? Lord Liu Kang told me of his Raiden's nobility and righteousness, about his steadfast leadership in the defense of Earthrealm. He also told me about Raiden's dark side, how he could be consumed by rage and cast aside the rules he otherwise lived by. Making me mortal and incapable of such anger was to keep me from following in his footsteps. Though I understood the reasons why, I felt I had been done a disservice. To survive the coming battles, I may need the edge that only great rage can bring. As the Shaolin couldn't aid me, I sought out someone who could. Someone to stoke the fire within me and teach me to master it. For this, I could have no better teacher than the Shirai Ryu's Grand Master. To elude capture by Empress Melina, I joined Havoc's Crusade in Saido. There, I summoned more magic than I thought possible, and drowned out the old regime. Havoc's longed-for anarchy had been achieved. He was more than satisfied. But I was left empty and broken. Had I been satisfied as Outworld's High Mage, not let myself be tempted by Shang Tsung, a great city would not now lay in ruins. I've caused devastation, ended thousands of lives, all because of my blind ambition. I've betrayed my oath, my sovereign, and my realm. These high crimes merit punishment, and I'll accept whatever the Empress gives me. My only ambition now is to one day be forgiven. With General Shao freed from prison, we began raising a new army against the royal family. Though many were eager recruits, few were good at soldiering. It was so bad, the general was forced to change tactics. He decided 
that we needed a doomsday weapon. That weapon isn't a thing, though. It is a monster. Onaga, the Dragon King. The General told me the old legends were true, that his ancient ancestor defeated Onaga, trapping him deep inside Mount Sagan. The Dragon King is still there today, his pent-up fury waiting to be unleashed. Because Onaga is so dangerous, the General wouldn't risk trying to tame him before. But now, he feels we have no choice. Though I likely won't survive, I accept this mission gladly. I can think of no greater honor than to give my life in the General's service. After fleeing Outworld, I hadn't expected to return. But then I also hadn't expected the new Empress to make me an offer I couldn't refuse. To thank me for helping stop General Shao's rebellion, she asked me to be her emissary to the Zaterans. Going home. Bearing the seal of the royal house, I would show, once and for all, that my mutation wasn't to be feared. That it wasn't a source of shame. To my surprise, I was welcomed. But those warm smiles hid a dark secret. I stumbled upon a trove of official records which showed that my shape-shifting ability isn't unique. Many Saterans are born with it, but are killed by their government to keep it from spreading. Who started this barbaric policy? Who is now enforcing it is unknown. But I will find out. And I will put an end to this madness. No sooner had Titan Shang Tsung been defeated than Bi Han and his loyalists hunted us down. Outnumbered, we fled to Japan. There, we sought refuge from an old family friend. As children, we played together. But Harumi Shirai was a woman now, the head of her clan. Her strength, beauty, and intellect awed me. Also incensed by Bihan's betrayal, Harumi agreed to help me forge a new clan, one that would stand against him and defend Earthrealm. Her aid proved invaluable, and as time went on, we grew closer. To honor Harumi and pay respects to my new bride, I named the clan after her, calling it the Shirai Ryu. Now the battle against my brother begins in earnest. The Shirai Ryu won't rest until Bihan is defeated and the Lin Kuei's honor restored. After escaping Lei Chin prison, I was hounded by the Imperial police. I needed a place to hide and to recuperate while I plotted the best way forward. I knew the remote canton of my youth would be perfect. To escape capture, I traveled by sea. Little did I know that a gargantuan storm was brewing. My tiny craft was smashed apart. I closed my eyes, waiting to drown, hoping that the Netherrealm wouldn't claim my soul. But when I reopened them, I found myself not in hell, but on a deserted island. From its ruins, I could tell that great sorcerers had once lived there. In the caves beneath the ruins, I found what I can only describe as a well of souls. Once I learn how to wield its power, I will become invincible. been lost, but the war isn't over. I won't stop fighting until I take Outworld's throne. 
that they thought late in prison would hold me is laughable. Once free, I began planning my next campaign. I would need an unstoppable army to overthrow Melina. Unfortunately, most of my former soldiers lacked the courage to rally to my standard. Rebuilding my army would require finding new recruits. And that task is proving easier than expected. Outworld's golden age has left more than a few behind. Without hope, without power, they eagerly heed my call to tear down Melina's government. As the darkness enveloped me, I took a long last look at my family. I did not expect to see them again until their souls joined mine in the living forest. But miraculously, my beloved husband delivered me from oblivion. Though he couldn't save my body, Jared had preserved my soul. Like him and countless others, I am now a part of Ermac. Yet ours is not a peaceful repose. The collected souls within Ermac have their own needs and agendas. Before we can speak as one, we must first reach consensus. I had thought, as the former rulers of Outworld, I and Jared would hold sway. But here we are, two souls among many thousands, fighting for the right to be heard. And if there is one thing we do well together, it is fight. We will win the right to govern Ermac as we once had governed Outworld. And we will rule for the benefit of all. Kwai Liang and I were working hard to build our new clan. But even with the help of his close friend Harumi, it was difficult. The biggest problem was finding the right initiates. Then, one night, while walking outside Harumi's compound, I was attacked. I thought at first it was a Lin Kuei assassin, but his strikes were too uncertain, too angry. My attacker, it turns out, was a boy. Homeless and hungry, his assault was born of desperation. He needed money so that he could eat. It was like looking at myself 15 years ago. I would have ended up just like him if the Lin Kuei hadn't taken me in. So I took the boy to Kwai Liang, who also appreciated his fire. We made him our first initiate. The boy's name? Hanzo Hasashi. I had broken the Lin Kuei free of Liu Kang's enslavement. We were now masters of our destiny, and could take our place among Earthrealm's great nations. But taking and holding territory would require a vast army. I needed more fighters to make our presence felt. Then I recalled Shang Tsung's dragon warriors. An army of them would be unstoppable. But trafficking in such strong magic would surely draw Liu Kang's attention. Sector advised that we avoid detection by building our army using science, not sorcery. We've invested much into this endeavor, and we are beginning to see results. Once again proving the depths of Sector's genius. When we are done, all of Earthrealm will honor our desires and heed our demands. If not, they will face the Lin Kuei's wrath. Until recently, I hadn't met Li Mei, but I had heard the stories. How the Umgadi's matron superior blamed her for not preventing Emperor Jared's murder. How she quit in disgrace rather than accept punishment. 
But those stories didn't fit the woman I now knew. Li Mei would never have been so negligent. Eventually, I uncovered the truth. The failures and mistakes which led to the Emperor's murder, they resulted from poor decisions made by the Matron Superior themselves. They made Li Mei their scapegoat. When the Empress found out, she wanted the Ungari disbanded. But I convinced her that it could be reformed. To make sure it did, she put me in charge. I am humbled by this sacred responsibility. The Ungadi, my sisters, they are my life. I will not let them be brought down by the acts of a selfish few.